Hello, good people. It's great to be back with you and to get back into Joseph Ratzinger's book, Introduction to Christianity. We are ready to dive into chapter two. And in this chapter, Ratzinger is going to talk about the history and structure of the Apostles' Creed, how it came to have the form that we know it in today, and um, what its original form was in the early church, and how it changed and why. So he says that the basic form of the profession of faith that we have now, the Apostles' Creed, took shape during the course of the second and third centuries in connection with the ceremony of the baptism. So far as its place of origin is concerned, the text comes from the city of Rome, but its internal origin lies in worship more precisely in the conferring of baptism. Thus, the oldest form of the confession of faith takes the shape of a tripartite dialogue of question and answer and is, moreover, embedded in the ceremony of baptism. Now, he explains that the way it was first done is based on what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So what would happen is there would be three questions put to the person who is going to be baptized. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Do you believe in Jesus Christ the Son of God? And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? The person being baptized would then respond to each of these three questions with the word credo, I believe, and each time then would be immersed in the water. Now, during the second century and going into the third century, this simple formula was expanded in the middle section. That's the section about Christ. The reason is because <clears throat> there were some disputes over what was the identity of this Jesus who was being, the person was being baptized in the name of. So to make sure there was clarity about that, the creed was expanded in that section. Later, it was further expanded in the end section about talking about the Holy Spirit, and then it was clarified and developed as a confession of faith that was talking about the present and future Christian attitude. By the time of the fourth century, there is extant a continuous text that is detached from the question and answer format. Now, he says that the fact that it's still in Greek makes it probable that it dates originally from the third century, since by the fourth, the final change to Latin had happened in the Roman liturgy. And a Latin translation appears very soon after. Because the church at Rome had a special position of primacy, that Roman baptismal profession which is also known as the symbolum or symbol, was quickly able to become spread throughout the Latin speaking area. Now, in the course of this, there were some minor text, textual, te, excuse me, textual alterations. Charlemagne wanted to unify his empire, and so he wanted to make sure that there was one form of the creed throughout the entire um, area that he ruled. And that, that unified text, which was originally used in Gaul, was finally ad adapted in Rome, adopted in Rome in the ninth century. Now, a legend appears, and he says it's as early as around the fifth century that <clears throat> attributes each of the 12 articles of the creed to one of the 12 apostles. And he does say that that is a legend. 
in the Eastern Church, that would be in the area of the Byzantine Empire and the Byzantine Church, they never had a unified symbol of that sort because there was no one church that occupied a position similar to the Roman Church in the West. So it had a variety of symbols. Let me talk just a minute about this word symbol. So this word comes from two roots, two Greek roots. One has to do with together, and the other is um, the same root as the word ball. So it has to do with throwing something together. The idea is that you can put together two things that are, that are different and you can create a new third thing with a meaning. Okay, John Bervakis talked a lot about symbolism in his series lately. And um, I do believe that at one time, a symbol was also a broken kind of stone or piece of pottery that someone would have one piece of it and another person would have another piece, or the pottery would be in the location of a meeting. And so you would have to come into the meeting and to prove that you belonged there, you would throw together your piece of pottery, broken piece with the piece that was there. And that would be your acknowledgement that you belonged in that group. So I think that's the origin of how we end up with the word for the creed that shows that you belong within the church as having this meaning of being a symbol. It doesn't mean, it's not exactly meaning symbolic as we think, but it's a related origin between those, those thoughts. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Now he mentions that there is a different emphasis between the Roman creed and the Western creed in general and the East and the way the East viewed salvation and the way the Western church viewed salvation. And he said that in the West, the church is making positivistic statements of the Christian story that accepts the fact that to save us, God became man. It doesn't try to get beyond that into the causes or into the cosmic implications. Whereas the East, on the other hand, has always sought to see the Christian faith in a cosmic and metaphysical perspective. And so the Christology and belief in creation in the East are very closely linked together. And this brings a cosmic dimension to the way the faith is seen in the East. He says that this is becoming more of a current thought. Um, it's achieving more currency in the West as um, in this generation. So, and of course he recognizes more contact with the East, both with Eastern Christians, and of course with thought of the Far East as well. Now, um, he goes into the, uh, the fact that when we look at the creed and we talk about the history of the creed, that in the his studying the history of the creed, we're actually looking at all of the points of tension, the points of um, stress, the points of dissension, that have occurred within the church and also the church's relationship with the world. And he says that this has something to do with the question of Christian belief itself. First of all, the creed cuts across all the tensions and cleavages and expresses a common ground of belief in the triune God. But he goes on to say, it also expresses already, and I'm going to read a, a rather lengthy passage at this point of what he wrote, because I think what he says here is very wise and important. But it also expresses already, when he says already, he means even in starting going back a number of centuries, like into the, you know, fourth, fifth century. It also expresses already the beginning of the fateful split between East and West. 
the special position that belonged to Rome in the West as the administrative center of apostolic tradition and the tension that consequently arose for the church as a whole become visible in its history, that is, in the history of the creed. And finally, in its present shape, this text also expresses the politically inspired uniformity impressed on the church in the West, and thus the political alienation of belief, its utilization as a means to imperial unity. In using this text, which was promoted as the Roman one, and in the process forced on Rome in this shape from outside, we find present in it the necessity for belief to break through the prison bars of political aims and to assert its own independence. Now you might find such frank uh, words from a man who is in time going to become the Pope about how the faith is used politically to be quite surprising. But I think Ratzinger is a particularly clear-eyed and wise commentator on the state of affairs in the church and the world. Then he says, thus the fate of this text demonstrates how the answer to the call from Galilee mingles at the moment of its entry into history with all the human circumstances of man with the special interests of one region, with the estrangement of those called to unity among themselves, with the tricks of the powers of this world. I think it is important to see this, for this too is part of the worldly reality of believing, namely that the bold leap into the infinite signified by it can only take place on the petty scale of everything human. That here too, where man makes his greatest venture, so to speak, the leap over his own shadow to the meaning that bears him up, his action is not pure noble greatness, but instead it shows him up as a divided being pitiful in its greatness, yet still great while well, he is pitiful something absolutely central becomes visible here, namely that faith has to do and must have to do with forgiving, that it aims at leading man to recognize that he is a being that can only find himself in the reception and transmission of forgiveness, a being that needs forgiveness even in his best and purest moments. When one follows up in this way the traces left behind in the text of the creed by man and his human attributes, the doubt may well arise whether it is right to use this text as a peg on which to hang the sort of introduction to the basic content of the Christian faith aimed at in this book. Is it not to be feared that by doing so we are already moving on to dubious terrain? The question must be posed, but anyone who follows it up will nevertheless be able to confirm that in spite of its checkered history, this creed does represent at all decisive points an accurate echo of the ancient church's faith which for its part is in its kernel, the true echo of the New Testament message. The differences between East and West of which we spoke just now are in fact, differences of theological emphasis, not difference of creed. It remains true, of course, that in our attempt at understanding the creed, we must take care to keep referring the whole to the New Testament and to read and interpret it in the light of the aims of the latter. In other words, the best way he's saying to read the creed is to keep referring back to the New Testament. And you're gonna see him do that a lot. Now he's gonna ask um, or go into another point. And that has to do with the relationship between doctrine and creed 
and also the meaning of what would later come to be called dogma. He said that the creed originally is part of that framework of baptism with the triple answer to the triple question, do you believe in God, in Christ, and in the Holy Spirit? And he said, we have to remember that there was a corollary to this positive statement of, yes, I believe in, the, in God, in Christ, and in the Holy Spirit. He said that there was also a renunciation. So there's a renunciation that's a negative statement. And then these three answers of, I believe, were the positive statements. So what was the renunciation? The renunciation was, I renounce the devil, his service, and his works. So this places the expression of the creed in the act of conversion, a turn of one's being from worship of the visible and practicable to trust in the invisible. And I want you to notice what he's saying here. He's saying that when our life is consumed by, when what dominates us, is the visible and the practicable that we are actually serving the devil and participating in the devil's works. So when we turn to the invisible, he says it could literally be translated by I hand myself over to the invisible or I ascent to the invisible. He said, so this is an important point for the conversation that we're having here in this little corner of the internet. He says that in its origin, faith is not a recitation of doctrines or an acceptance of theory, right? It's not that um, propositional knowing. He says, it signifies an all-encompassing movement of human existence, or to use Heidegger's language, one could say it signifies an about turn by the whole person that from then on constantly structures one's existence. And in the process of this turning about, the I and the we, the I and the you interact. Back to this um, back to this issue of this question of the dialogue, right? The dialogic structure of this in this initial expression of the creed. He says, on the one hand, it's highly personal because you're going to be saying, I renounce, I believe. Okay, it's my existence that has to do the turning. But, he says, the decision of the I is made in answer to a question. It's in the interplay of do you believe? So, he says that this dialogic structure of the original creed seems to him to be a much more accurate expression of the structure of faith than the later simplified collected collective I form. That would be like the form that we have it today. He said, if we wish to feel our way toward the fundamental nature of Christian faith, it will be right to go back beyond this current structure that we have, the purely dogmatic text, and to regard its first dialogue form as the most appropriate one ever created. And that's a lot of the a lot of what we're talking about in this corner of the internet is the importance of dialogue and the way dialogue causes things to emerge. Now he's going to make a little digression. What he's talking about here in his digression is the way that other creeds came to be, and he's really talking here more about like the Nicene Creed and the the creeds that were. Um, put together kind of by the bishops that were assembled in the, um, in the various councils, that he says that they were striving for right doctrine and that this was going to become, end up becoming what we call dogma. Okay, 
Now, the point he wants to make here is that when these councils, the councils that came up with the early, with the creeds, with the Nicene Creed especially, he says they were not get trying to formulate doctrinal statements. Okay, now this might seem strange if, if you don't understand how these things came to be. So let me kind of see if I can use an illustration that would help you understand what he means when he says they're not trying, they weren't trying to formulate doctrinal statements. Okay, what you had, of course, were a lot of Christological controversies that came up, especially in the third and fourth centuries. And um, I want to use an illustration of, think about this. Let's say you have a sister, and we're going to name your sister Karen. So you have a sister Karen, and you grew up with her, so you know her real well. And um, you know her habits, you know her likes and dislikes, and you're real close, and close with her. And you're out somewhere sometime, and someone happens to, you know, for some encounter you're having with someone, and they happen to find out what your name is. And they say, oh. They say, do you, know, do you know Karen, who has your same name, your same last name? Is she related to you? And you say, yeah, I have a sister named Karen. And the person says, ah, okay, well, I know your sister Karen. In fact, just last week, your sister Karen and I were having lunch together at a Thai restaurant. And you look at the person and you think, well, that's strange. My sister does not like spicy food at all. I can barely get her to eat Mexican food. And here she's eating Thai food. I, that sounds really strange. And then the person goes on and said, yeah, you know, she was wearing that yellow dress that she likes to wear so much, that sparkly yellow dress. And then you think, oh, wait a minute. My sister Karen doesn't have any yellow dress. She thinks yellow looks terrible on her and she never wears yellow. What in the world is this person talking about? And then the person says, yep, she was telling me all about her uh, trip to France last summer. And then you start laughing and say, no, you got the wrong person. Um, I do have a sister named Karen, but this person you're describing, this person with the same name, this is not my sister. I know my sister and uh, none of these things are true about my sister. She doesn't uh, like spicy food. She doesn't own a yellow dress and she did not go to France last summer. And the person looks at you and says, tries to start insisting that yes, that Karen that they're describing is actually your sister. You think they were crazy. That's what was happening with Christianity. So the church had a, a knowledge from personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember that the church is birthed from the apostles who personally know Jesus and have passed along, you know, the faith in what Jesus taught them. Then you have some other people who come up and say, well, hey, I know this Jesus and, you know, I'm going to tell you about him. And this is, and the church goes, no, 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 that's, no, that's not the Jesus that, that we have. You see, Jesus is not just some sort of wax nose you can put on and shape to whatever shape you want. Jesus is a real person that the church knew. They were with Jesus when the church started. And so that's why the attitude is not that when the church makes statements about who Christ is, that they're somehow formulating doctrine. What they're doing is responding to someone who's coming and saying that Jesus is someone other than who they know. Now, this is, this is already apparent in the New Testament. You can see this in the writings of St. John. Um, at one point, he says that, um, that if someone comes and they don't confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, then, you know, they're not part of the body of Christ. But why would he say that? It's because that the what he was dealing with at his time there, right there in the first century, already was some people who were saying, well, this was the Gnostic viewpoint, right? They were saying, you know, they didn't have any problem with Jesus Christ being called the Son of God. I mean, their idea that, you know, God might um, ha come down and 
and have a, a child with a woman or you know be like one of the greek heroes or something and and that there would be some human who could be called the son of god uh there, that was not an issue for them what was an issue for them was that you would say that god could be called the son of man that was the problem because the idea that god would take come down and actually take flesh and become man that was a real problem for the gnostics because they did not think that the material world was of a very high status if you remember the ancient cosmologies the earth is in the center right the the earth is in the center because it's low what's right under the earth hell right that's in the ancient cosmology the earth is just a little bit above hell. As you get further out in the circles, you get to things that are more holy, more rarefied, the Imperium realm, the, the realm of the celestial beings that are higher. And so the idea of God actually coming down and becoming man, that was, mm, nah, they did not think that humanity was a very good look for divinity they didn't like that and so that was their they would they would have things to say about christ that did not match what the church knew about him so ratzinger goes on to talk about the um, question of who is and who was christ that shook the church in the fourth and fifth centuries and he wants to point out that this was not concerned with metaphysical speculations. He says, in fact, that metaphysical speculations could not have shaken those two centuries down to their very foundations and down to the simplest people living in them. On the contrary, the question at issue was this. What happens when I myself become a Christian? When I enroll myself under the banner of this Christ and thereby accept him as the authoritative man, as the measure of humanity, what kind of shift in being do I thus accomplish? What attitude to the business of being a man do I adopt? How deep does this process go? What estimate of reality as a whole does it involve? So we've got some really good questions that he's asking here, and he's saying that these are the real questions. In other words, the questions are not metaphysical questions. They're not, as John Verveke might put it, they're not epistemological questions. They're existential questions. And so these existential questions is the reason why the questions about the identity of Christ so roiled the third and fourth centuries. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of this section of uh, Ratzinger's book, Introduction to Christianity. This is the first video on chapter two. I think it's possible I might get through chapter two in just two videos, which would be um, much better than I did on chapter one, because chapter one really took quite a while. So I hope that you will be joining me for the next video on this book. And until we are to together again, remember to treat yourself as though you are someone you are responsible for helping, because you are responsible, so am I, and together we are making the world. Bye for now. Thanks so much for watching.